I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. You're listening to a DM podcast. Welcome to The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. As an author, ad man and theologian, I've always been interested in people's stories. Not just those with a high profile, but people from all walks of life, regardless of fame. Which is why I created this show. Each guest who takes the Five of My Life challenge chooses a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. It's amazing what you can learn when discussing someone's five choices. I hope you enjoy listening to the show as much as I enjoy making it. Francis Fitzgerald is a member of the European Parliament for Dublin. Former Deputy Prime Minister, she has spent her life working to deliver change and reform in Ireland. First as a social worker and family therapist for 10 years, then in government with roles including Minister for Justice and Equality and being the state's first ever Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. Francis was nominated to take the Five and Life Challenge by a previous guest, Nancy Klein. So, Francis, welcome to Five of My Life. Well, thank you for the invitation. Well, the invitation came via our mutual friend, Nancy Klein. Uh, she nominated you on Five of My Life. So you are a member of the exclusive and elite group we call the Sixers, because it's my sixth question. Would you mind telling us what your relationship with uh, Nancy is? Not at all. I first invited Nancy, Nancy Klein, uh, to a very big uh, seminar meeting in Dublin uh, on women's empowerment. And I met her back then, a long time ago, I think it was the late 80s. And we formed a friendship then. And I just think that her thinking is fantastic. I mean, she talks a lot about having time to think. And I think most of us do not have enough time to take the space to ask the question, what do you really want? And she has perfected, really, I would say, close to perfection, a method of helping people to think through issues, uh, to figure out what it is you really want yourself. What are the barriers? What's really true? And she particularly looks at the assumptions uh, that people make about situations. And it's fascinating how often we live with assumptions, but they're not actually true. So she has a, a sort of a, a way of unfurling the human mind. And she's set up a whole international school of thought and a, a, a people all over the world who follow this method. And I think it's really important for all of us, but for business, for companies, for politicians to actually try and work out those barriers that stop people thinking well. And they're going with the old rigid assumptions. So uh, she's become a friend and a mentor. She lives in Oxford now. She's um, American and she is the most amazing listener I have ever come across. And I have found her a wonderful mentor. And I was delighted, of course, when she nominated me because uh, it's an honor because she knows a lot of people around the world. She works in South Africa, America and everywhere. So that's just a very short summary, actually, even though it's a bit long, Nigel. I, I, I think she's absolutely sensational. And, and I found her the first time I read Time to Think, uh, transformational for me. And, and when I interviewed her on Five of My Life, I was terrified that I would interrupt her. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You get so conscious of how much you talk and how important it is to listen. And something she suggests, this is really simple, of course, if you're at a meeting, and I try and do it as much as I can. But, you know, so often you're at a meeting and you have silent participants mm. 
And she absolutely says, you go around and get absolutely everybody to speak. And I'm amazed how often I'm in political meetings when people are totally satisfied to have half a dozen people in the room who never open their mouth. And of course, you've got to get the thinking of everyone. And it's so rich. It doesn't matter about the level of experience, you know. So that's one of her key things about, you know, everybody. And then her other key question is, is there anything else? Is there anything yes. else? to keep thinking about the solutions you're looking for. So, and that book uh, is wonderful. I think it's her best book, actually, myself. I'd encourage anyone listening to read her work. Now, um, this interview had to be rearranged from its first one because you had a meeting with President Zelensky. Um, Would you mind, before we get into your five, uh, just telling us how he was bearing up when you talked to him? Well, he came to meet us in the European Parliament, uh, you know, by uh, actually by uh, by way of Zoom into the Parliament at that time. He wasn't traveling. He's traveling a little bit more now. But the European uh, Union in general has been incredibly supportive of his position in relation to the war. We see it as an attack on our values, on democracy. Uh, we support all of the member states are very supportive, many providing military aid. Ireland provides money. Uh, for various equipment and health and humanitarian issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, But he is such an extraordinary man. I mean, his resilience is incredible. And the European uh, Parliament was having a discussion with him about the situation in Ukraine, what supports he needed, what the situation was. It's not good. And uh, we're very worried about the continuation of the war and the indeterminate nature of it at this point, and Russians dreadful aggression and the loss of life actually on both sides. So it was a very moving event. I mean, we are just so impressed with his leadership and uh, want to give him as much support as we can. It was very moving, very emotional. Gosh, well, listen, on to, on to lighter uh, matters. We, we are thrilled to have you on Five of My Life. And we always start with the film, Francis, and you have chosen the most successful film of 19... 19- 64, uh, the film adaptation of Pygmalion in 1913, My Fair Lady. Um, Tell us your story behind that. It's so difficult to pick out any one film, isn't it? And actually, I think the five of my life as a concept, it's quite challenging, Nigel, you know, to sort of pick out those key things. And you wonder, well, gosh, is that really the most significant film I've seen or not? But I think (laughs) there's lots of different motivations why, you know, if you're asked to pick out five things in the five areas you want, that you would just at a particular moment in time say that one. And when I look back on the ones I picked, they're all quite nostalgic, actually. And maybe that's a function of getting older. Uh, They're not as contemporary as I feel I am myself in my work as a member of the European Parliament or in my life or in the way I've lived my life. So this one is very nostalgic and really goes back to my mother and uh, to my family in the 60s. My father was an army officer. My mother worked full time at home. Wonderful woman. I was the eldest of four. And I think what gave her an insight into the other world, another world, um, were films. And she grew up in a very small town in Ireland called Charleville, and she adored the Hollywood films. And, you know, she had, at that time in Ireland, she was born 1920. I mean, that's over 100 years ago. Can you believe it? She died at 95. And her story about growing up in a small town was the magic of the cinema. And, you know, she used to talk again and again about all the stars, the Cary Grants, etc., the different films. And I think there's nothing as magical as the story of being rescued. It's not very contemporary in terms of women's lives. And Betty Friedan, my choice of the uh, something we'll be talking about, is kind of the other side of this. But this was... Um, this was a, an escape, really. And it was beautiful music, beautiful people, very good acting and beautiful singing. So we had the old fashioned record player, you know, with the, you held it over the, the record and you played it. And actually, at that time, most families had very little goods. You know, there was very little. I, it's hard for me to believe that. But, you know, we were not into kind of um, you know, materialism in the way we all are now. We all have too much now. Then we had quite little. And so the the handful of records, I mean, to a young audience, this sounds crazy with Spotify, right? But, you know, yeah. most families had very few records. So My Fair Lady, I could have danced all night. I mean, I love that as a, a teenager. It's the equivalent of, you know, listening to, you know, who knows now. And so it, it was a very beautiful imaginative play and the young woman was being rescued of course by 
like a prince. So um, that's what I grew up with. And that's what women grew up with. You had to be rescued. You wouldn't do it yourself. And, you know, how far have we come, which is great. Well, that, that's a perfect link to your second choice on Five My Life, where you, you've chosen uh, the book that is widely regarded as one of the most influential non-fiction books of the last century. Uh, you've chosen The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan. And, and to my shame, I had never read that. I mean, I have now in your honour. Um, wow. I mean, gosh. I mean, I mean, even reading it in 2023, but God, I imagine reading it in 1963. Tell us your story behind that, Francis. Well, I, you know, I, I've worked for equality all my life. And uh, that arises really. My sort of motivation around equality probably comes from my parents who grew up as most people in Ireland did, in quite a stratified society. You know, the doctor, the dentist, the professional, you know, quite stratified in small towns. But my father, my mother, they got opportunities. And so I'm very, very keen for people at all levels to have opportunities. And I'm really concerned at what we're seeing in our cities now, whether it's uh, San Francisco, Washington, uh, some of our European cities, the disparities between rich and poor. I'm very keen on equality economically, socially, every way. And Betty Friedan really opened the door. She pulled back the curtains, as you say, on the position of women in America in the 60s and previously the 50s, really, and early 60s. And it was quite extraordinary. It was like a shock at the time to the system because what she said is the expectations of most women in the States or the projections onto women are incorrect and they're limiting women. I mean, I read a statistic when I was re-looking at the feminine mystique where most girls, say over 60% of young girls, dropped out of college because they felt if they stayed on in college, they wouldn't end up getting married. So they dropped out to get married. And even, well, I was born 1950, so even for me, 1970s, the whole issue of kind of getting married as opposed to your own development was kind of very, very strong. And again, for young people today, that's very hard to even think, given the social changes we've seen. So Betty Friedan said, the feminine mystique, you know, absolutely not. This is not actually when you talk to women, you know, setting the, the dinner table, getting, you know, the meals, waiting for the husband to come home. I mean, it's still very, very common in J Japan, for example, where I was, uh, you know, some time ago. Uh, cultural expectations, women and men will live in a certain way. Women will look after men and women really don't think about their own needs. So she blew this right out, wide open. And it was really, uh, I think, a huge influence on feminism in the States. And I, I kind of, when I read it, I felt the same as other women who read it. I thought this is ex extraordinary. And then, of course, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you saw an increasing equality movement. But she, I met her actually, I have a lovely photograph with her uh, when we invited her over to Dublin uh, to speak. And she was like a, a fabulous, you know, kind of low key, but but strong woman, very connected with Gloria Steinem and all these women who were at the four of the feminist MS magazine, Miss magazine. And I used to read all these at that time. And I was still in my early 20s, you know, really important, very good woman altogether. So um, my mum, God love her, was in the British Army and my um, dad was in the uh, Royal Navy. And when he uh, proposed to her and she accepted, they held a, a tea party to congratulate her and to fire her. Because back in those days, uh, if you worked for the government and you were a lady and you got engaged, you lost your job because you, you weren't allowed to work if you were going to get married. I mean, there weren't marches in the streets. It was completely accepted. Same in Ireland. Yeah, I mean, you go. It's just—it's incredible. And and there was a a line from the book that I, I really like because it almost goes beyond feminism. Where, where Betty said it's about moving women from femininity to full human identity. Yes, you're a human being, whether whether you're black, white, male, female, indeterminate, whatever. You're a human being, and 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 sort of eventually one of one of your phrases that i absolutely adore from one of your speeches that i've been watching was you know building a society where no one feels left out oh yes everyone's yeah. got the same opportunity that doesn't mean that everyone's going to be equal because because you're not everyone's going to be the deputy prime minister of Ireland like you because they might not be as hard working and, and clever or whatever but everyone's got the same opportunities yeah. and everyone is equally as valued so i i, I mean for that book to have the power I mean, obviously there are a few 
There are a few holes in it of any book 50 years later, but it really had a powerful effect on me, you know, reading it, you know, you know, 50 years after it was published. That's really interesting because in Ireland, you had to give up your job if you were in the civil service until 1972. And of course, wow. when it came to equal pay in Ireland, we were dragged kicking and screaming by the European Union for equal pay. And just this year in the Parliament, we've introduced what we call the Pay Transparency Directive, which means all member states in Europe, now the companies have to publish pay rates so that it's uh, it's done kind of anonymously, but every company has to say, what's the pay rate for women and men? And I mean, surprising differences are coming out. So that's ongoing. And we still have a 39% pension gap. I don't know what it is around the world uh, or in Australia, but in uh, in our, uh, Europe, it's 39% of a pension pay gap, which is extraordinary. And we still have many of those stereotypes. I mean, I've been, I've been part of that generation, you know. I mean, we all have, my friends and I uh, talk about this whole balancing of work and family life. It's still a challenge for young couples. It's still a challenge for young women, young men. And uh, so these issues are kind of perennial, you know, we, we kind of work with them. But this was a period of big change, you know, shattering. It's like shattering the glass ceiling. This shattered those conceptions. And it was very freeing for women. You know, you've got to discover yourself as well. And, you know, it's ongoing, as I say, Nigel, it doesn't go away for any of us. I, I had such fun researching you and your choices. You, you gave a wonderful speech where you talked about you, you are old enough to have seen Ireland change. You, amazing phrase. I think I might steal and use myself. Uh, it, it used to be a country of squinting windows. Would you mind talking uh, to that? Oh, yes. Yeah, over like over the generations. Squinting windows is a concept that, you know, every move you make is kind of monitored. And that goes back to the village or the town. It's from a novel, actually, the, 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 the title Squinting Windows. And again, it goes back to a stratified society. And of course, my background is in social work and sociology and social administration. So I'm very interested in social systems, social structures. And in, in Ireland, like we had a very patriarchal, hierarchical, Catholic ridden society. I can even remember it. Like I can remember the Easter ceremonies in a small town in Ireland where the women sat on one side and the men on the other. Can I believe it that I'm, I've got that old, that I remember that, <laughs> that, you know, I go back that far to when Ireland was like that. And squinting windows is very invasive, you know. It just means you've no freedom, you're watched. And, of course, there were very rigid rules about who got pregnant. If you got pregnant outside of marriage, that was the biggest sin. We put people into, you know, homes. We've had terrible scandals here called the Magdalene Homes, where women who were pregnant outside of marriage were kind of hidden away in laundries, doing desperate work. And the church was part of mm. that, the nuns and the priests and so on. But so was Irish society because we tolerated it. And there was some knowledge about it, you know, but the attitudes were very harsh. And I think it's about harsh attitudes. But when you, like I signed the marriage equality law, I, I brought marriage equality through the parliament in Ireland. And I mean, it's fantastic to see, you know, the respect and freedoms that we've moved towards compared to that era. So Ireland has made fantastic changes. We're probably one of the more liberal societies in Europe now, actually. And we've also, we're the last to bring in abortion rights. I think the last, maybe second last in Europe. You know, that's been done as well. Quite limited, but nevertheless, respecting sexual and reproductive choices in a way that you would never have imagined. And great credit to Irish citizens, you know, great credit to what we call in Ireland, the NGOs, non-governmental organizations, individuals, cam campaigning people, lobbyists, uh, working with government brought about that change. So it's a very different society, but there's still plenty to do. Don't get me wrong, Nigel, right across Europe <laughs> and the world, there's plenty of work and equality. But when you look at what we're talking about, you know, today, what we came from, my goodness. And as I say, no harm for younger people to hear it and remember it. But they're kind of saying, oh, my God, I don't believe that, you know. But listen, look at the authoritarian regimes that are having LGBTQI freedom areas. Can you believe it? In Poland right now. Mm -hmm. Look at what's happening in Uganda. Look at what's happening in Hungary. Look at what's happening in Trump's America. What happened to democracy? I mean, democracy itself is under threat. So we've got to be very, very uh, cautious, very careful. I'm very vigilant because things can go back as well as forward. 
as we saw in Germany in the 40s. So it takes, I mean, uh, I forget who says this, but it takes just one generation for all the hard one progress to be completely wiped out. And you're absolutely right. You, you know, it, it, I, I spoke to a, a mate who lives in Dublin because I've been asking people about you. And he said uh, that you have spent your life fighting for fairness, which I think is a, is a lovely a yes. summation and, and, it, and, and, and more power to you to be to have been at the forefront when all those wonderful changes have happened but but you're right you, you know in 20 years time we could be talking and you know some nutter has got in and reversed it all so it needs you know it needs the next generation to pick up the baton you know it really does and uh, it needs young people's energy and vitality and awareness actually as much as anything and of course it's a very in many ways a very privileged uh, generation now in in Europe young people but then they can't get housing you know we've a big problem with housing and we're going to have to change the way we think about housing now as a kind of a a social right actually and uh, if we if we want to keep our city safe if we want to keep our citizens safe, if we want to reduce the levels of violence against women, my contention is you've got to create more equal societies. Because if you don't have more equal societies, if you're not conscious of it, if you let poverty thrive, what happens is it destroys the very quality of those who are privileged. You know, so we're all in this together. You cannot change the fact that what affects one affects another. Even if you like to de- you know, delude yourself, you go, well, it just does. Absolutely. If the world comes down a thousand billionaires and lots it of does. homeless people, it just ain't going to work. Exactly. Now, on Five of My Life, uh, I, I love the third choice, the song, because we add it all to a Five of My Life uh, Spotify playlist, which is incredibly varied. Uh, so it's, it's got rap music, heavy metal, classical, choral. And now, in your honour, it's going to have Tchaikovsky's 1876 Swan Lake, the world's most performed ballet. Tell us your story behind that, Francis. Oh, well, I, I lived in London for seven years. I, I went to the London School of Economics and I my first son was born in London. Mostly before he was born, I used to spend a lot of time. Uh, I was working in social work at the time and I, I really loved that. I was working with a lot of young people. I was working on fostering and adoption issues and just general family services. And London, of course, is such a cultural centre, which I absolutely loved. And my husband and myself used to spend a lot of time going to rather cheap seats. I don't know why we always bought cheap seats, but we bought so many of them. We'd be up very high, you know, in Covent Garden. And uh, we'd go to the South Bank and we'd go to English National Opera and so on. So it was a very kind of opportunity for lovely culture for us. But the ballets in Covent Garden to this day are magical. And this is what's so sad about the war as well, you know, to think think about, you know, some people are saying, you know, Russian art, Russian artists, Russian orchestras, we can't have them. And I I totally understand that. It's like the debate about whether Russian people can take part in the Olympics or not. But you you go back to the, and I've been to Russia several times. And I mean, it's the wonderful uh, music that, that, that came from Russia and the beautiful performance. It's so elegant, so beautiful. I think ballet is, again, it's another world and it's you know, quite nostalgic when you see it, but it's the arts and I'm a big supporter of the arts. I have a son who's an actor. And this is another point about keeping cities vibrant. If you want to keep a city vibrant, you've got to support the arts. You've got to support creative and artistic people if you want your society to thrive. And I think there's some really interesting research about that from around the world as well. But, you know, one of the things we're worried about now is that the creative spaces are getting less and less, you know, with the big companies coming in, technology, spaces at a premium in our city. And how do you keep spaces for creativity, for actors to gather, for musicians, uh, for the pubs where the musicians play to thrive? And you're really losing something very fundamental when you lose the arts. And uh, it's something for governments, I think, and policymakers. But it's hard to beat these commercial forces in our cities. 
and a lot of the arts community are moving out to the suburbs and that's okay too but I think we really need to keep our city centre arts spaces and of course Covent Garden in London is just extraordinary and uh, wonderful productions and I hope they continue forever they they totally modernise and adapt and do different uh, you know presentations of these uh, classical story so i'm delighted you've added it to <laughs> to your music <laughs> you, you know when i'm in conversations with people who are in positions of power which every now and then i am it depresses me when i get the sense that they think the arts and creativity is a soft not really serious issue you're, you're missing the point of what it is to be you know fully human and for a society to be a functioning successful society we're not all just you know, units of economic value. You know, what is the point in having a, a successful economy if everyone is on autopilot trudging to soulless jobs? We're supposed to be lifting our eyes to the heaven. And, you know, you know the arts isn't an indulgence. Absolutely. Now, I have to ask you a question because I, I didn't realise this. Is um, Swan Lake has got two different endings. Have you seen... Have you seen the happy one as well as the sad one? I think I have, yes. <laughs> I've seen a good few productions. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? You know, it all works out or else it's total tragedy. It's a bit like life, That's you right. know, <laughs> unpredictable. Uh, but again, it's kind of funny in a way because it's the rescue theme again for women. It's not disconnected to Betty Friedan because so much of our arts traditionally, and even if you think about, you know, the big literary prizes, so few women, you were nominated. I see for the first time this year in England in the, the proms, the big, big, you know, uh, musical event. The first time. Can you believe this? There's going to be a female conductor. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I just can't believe it's the, it's this is the first year there's going to be a female conductor at the proms in the Albert Hall, where I actually got my degree. <laughs> we were presented in the Albert Hall. I was in Bordeaux recently and I was at a concert and it was a female conductor. And it was so interesting and, and just a bit different and great to see. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, your fourth choice on Five of My Life, it's always the place, and you have chosen uh, Leinster House, which I've been Google imaging and reading all about. But tell us, well, tell us first of all, people who don't know what it is, where it is, and your story behind that. It used to be in the countryside, and now it's right in the centre of Dublin. <laughs> it's surrounded by a city. It was the home of one of the sort of aristocrats, uh, you know, in Ireland, who was a, a Duke uh, of, of Leinster, I think. So it was a private home originally, very, very big private home. Now it's a, you know, it's been added on to, but the essential old building is the parliament, actually. So both our parliament, our doll, it's called, and our Senate, the upper and low, lower houses, are both situated in Leinster House. So when I first went into politics, when I was 42, I was elected into Leinster House. And I remember the magic of it, actually, just feeling that you've been elected by the people, that people have supported you, people have gone out in the streets. And we have a very tough election, electoral system here. You really have to fight for every vote. It's very competitive. It's harsh. It's tough. By the way, I think Australian politics are unbelievably harsh. I, I, I must tell you a story. I was at a lunch in um, in Australia and it was uh, the Lansdowne Club. They have the biggest St. Patrick's Day event, I think, almost in the world. I mean, you know, huge. And uh, the female prime minister of, of Australia was at it at the time, Julia. And yeah. she was prime minister and Tony Abbott was the opposition. And they were, I have to tell you, Nigel, they were vicious with one another. They were just unbelievable. And I, I got up and I said, I've recently been made a minister and I thought Irish politics was tough, but it's nothing like this. <laughs> so um, anyway, Leinster House is where we do our parliamentary work. And for me, I suppose it's a big part of my life. I've spent probably 30 years in politics at this stage. And I've, had, I've seen great highs in there, marriage equality being one of them. A children's referendum being another. Uh, I've seen the ups and downs. I've had very tough times myself in there. Politics isn't always fair. So to me, it's kind of been a big part of my life. And it's had great joy, great happiness and, and very tough times. And I think you have to be very resilient in this life. So I, I discovered I was resilient. And thank God for that, uh, because you need to be in politics. So it's, it's a very attractive place. I like it. What's the most useful mistake? that you've made? The most useful, that's a funny way of putting that question. The most useful mistake. Ask me that another way, Nigel. So, so the slightly the slightly negative way is yes. what's your biggest regret 
but so I'm reframing it as a positive thing. So, so. I know, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, it's a more personal thing. And it's what I would say to either young men or young women. It's actually to, at an earlier stage, have more confidence in myself, not to be intimidated, to just really go for what you believe in and not to be worrying about the other person. I think a lot of us, and I would say it's a trait I still have, less and less as I've got older, obviously. But, you know, just to have the confidence in your own point of view, because no matter how young you are or inexperienced or whatever, just your own belief system, you know, that's what I really would say to people. So I would like to have been stronger, uh, you know, in my own confidence at an earlier stage. And I don't quite understand why I wasn't. And people would be surprised hearing me say that because, you know, people have these perceptions of the other always being perfectly confident and, oh, you can speak so well or you can present so well. But actually, I find a lot of women, maybe more than men, but it may apply to men as well. I find a lot of my contemporaries and even younger women, there is still a, quite a bit of misogyny out there. And I think you're often fighting a sort of everyday sexism that you have to kind of, you just have to cut it out in your head and, and just get in there and be as strong as you can be. That would be probably the biggest thing, you know, that I really love to see younger women who are so confident and younger men. It's great to see it. And, um, you know, it's really about being yourself. It's the old Betty Friedan, you know, get out there and do what you want to do. <laughs> what a great answer. Now, I've got another question, which, and I think I might have misunderstood this, and I'm embarrassed at my ignorance of the ins and outs of Irish political history. So forgive me if I have grievously <laughs> misunderstood this. But I was going down lots of rabbit holes on your choices and your career. And I came across Owen O'Duffy, the founder of Fina Gale, if I've got that right. Yes. It was reading a little bit unsavoury. Have, have, I, have I misunderstood that or have I? No, not really. I mean, it just shows you about fascism, you know. It has a lot of reaches. Um, it reaches a lot of people and that's always an accusation. And I think there's there is obviously uh, truth in it. Um, so, no, that's, that's right. Uh, but certainly that that shifted and changed pretty quickly. They were terrible times, you know, when you look back. And this is, goes back to our point about how quickly societies can change and influences and losing what we've gained. We've got to be, like my own party, Fine Gael, has played a huge part in the foundation of the state here, you know, setting up the army, setting up the police forces, all of that type of thing, very much law and order. But, you know, when you delve into any history of any political party, there is a journey that you have to go on. Yeah, no, you're right about that. I'm so glad to, to hear you talk about that because I, I think it speaks to a broader point as well about the capacity for people and societies to change. Oh, yes. I, I, I don't buy into the philosophy of despair. So if you were, oh, I don't know, in the 1960s looking at South Africa, you might think, well, gosh, this is never going to, you, you know, this, this, this is unconscionable. And you go, well, well, you know, the, in in... In the main, the arc of justice, I mean, it's long, but it bends towards the light. It does. Not to give up on anyone, not to give up on any society. And hopefully, you know, in 10 years time, people will look back at, I don't know, Russian Ukraine and it will have sorted itself out somehow. You, you know, it, it's just not, don't give in. But I suppose you're always looking, um, whether it's in politics or policy or governments or personally, you're always looking at continuities and discontinuities. Sometimes I'm quite surprised at the continuities on the negative side, violence against women being one of them, like extraordinary. I would have thought 30 years ago, more education, men better educated, women better educated, this, this would be something that would decrease. Instead, we see incredible continuities and new forms like cyber violence, which we're now legislating for around the world. Uh, but you're right. I mean, I, I am an optimist, totally. And I think societies do uh, develop. But you have to be so alert. And cyber violence is a very good example, uh, you know, yeah. how much we're seeing of that and how intimidating it is. And it's putting a lot of women off politics as well. You know, the threats yeah. and the comments and the the things that are said about you online. So, yeah, that's our, our lives. And uh, I think it's why politics matters, by the way. It's why I do, despite having very tough times myself, why I would say to people, it's the best we have and democracy is the best we have. And let's try and make it better. But it's very unfinished. 
I say that in relation to women, but I say it in relation to how well we serve the public as well, how well we deal with poverty. You know, you look at America, how can they tolerate the levels of poverty? You look at India. So equality is not a goal in every society, you know? No. We're moving to your fifth and final choice. And uh, I know there was a debate because you wanted to have two and I wouldn't let you, but we are going to mention your running up <laughs> selection. Uh, but the thing that you landed on, on Five of My Life, was your father's hurling medals. So could you, for, for, for my listeners who might not know what hurling is, uh, could, you, could you describe hurling and the medals and the story behind that? Well, hurling is one of our national sports. Um, we have a Gaelic Athletic Association that supports football and hurling. And hurling is, is played with a hurling stick and a very small ball. And you try and move it from one end of the field to the other and get a goal or a point. It's very, very difficult. It's very skilled. People are amazed at the pace of it when they come and, and watch it. And um, my father was, was uh, you know, took up hurling early on and for his county won what was considered, uh, you know, very important, an All-Ireland medal for his team when he was, you know, 17. So this was very important to him. And it is a national sport and people love it. So his medals and the medal for the All-Ireland, this was the town really celebrated. So again, it's a nostalgic choice. It's not a kind of a current choice, but it's a, a nostalgic family choice, which was about the celebration of sport, the role it can play. And it's something I'm very interested in, in terms of women and sport. 30 years ago, I was working on trying to ensure more women were involved in sport. And we're seeing that coming on hugely, particularly in the last 10 years. And uh, so the medals were like, and I have them. I'm the eldest of four, but I have the little box of medals. And uh, he, so he played all over the county. He played in the army. He played for his for his town. He played for his county. And it's kind of played nationally. So it's just a lovely remembrance of my father, who was quite a jolly character and, um, you know, very happy person, got his opportunity in Ireland, the Ireland of the 1940s, to join the army. So I've, I've taken you on a bit of a history journey about Ireland today, and I hope that's OK, because contemporary Ireland is a very different place. Um, but some of the points I've made, you know, that's where we've come from. And, and Five of My Life, in, in essence, is a reflective show. So yes. that's completely fine. I expect people to be nostalgic because it is people looking back and thinking, well, they've got half an hour, 40 minutes to the five of my life, the stories of my life. So I, I love people being nostalgic. I, I've got a quote for you uh, from the Financial Times, uh, 2020. Um, and it was after the final. And the, the, uh, the journalist wrote, hurling is the best sport ever. And if the Irish had colonized the world, nobody would have heard of football. <laughs> that's very nice yeah Hurl hurling would have been the sport yes yeah 100 percent. and it's it's sort of um so in australia we've got afl which is a fantastic sport but just its footprint you know historically you, you know it was sort of late to the party so everyone goes on about football not about afl now yes. your second choice your special guest i'm allowing you ex-deputy prime minister of ireland you get special <laughs> Um, you've said, please, please, can we also talk about the notes that you've got from the wonderful, 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 dearly departed Seamus Heaney, the poet. Um, you've got a note from him that you were thinking about having as your choice? Well, you know, I suppose it's to remember his poetry and the person that he was. And of course, we have American presidents uh, endlessly quoting his poetry, President Clinton and Biden, who's just been in Ireland. And I knew Seamus, uh, you know, uh, not as a close friend, but I just knew him socially. I would meet him occasionally. And uh, when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature, I wrote to him. And about six or seven months afterwards, I got the most beautiful note from him. And he was saying, thank you so much for congratulating me. He said, you know, one of the pleasures, not least one of the pleasures of getting the Nobel Prize was to hear from the true and the admired. And I thought, you know what? And it was handwritten and it was so beautiful. And it's funny the things that touch us in our lives. You know, it's like I remember the first time I got a merit prize in school, the first time you get elected. I mean, these things sustain you and people 
giving you good quality feedback. And Nancy, by the way, we started this session talking about Nancy. Nancy says we hear the negative things much more than we hear the positive. And if you want to get somebody to hear something positive, you have to say it eight times more than the negative. That's just the way our psychology is. So I think that had a a lovely meaning for me to get those beautifully crafted words from Seamus Heaney at the time. And of course, it, it brings us back to his beautiful poetry. Wonderful. Now, I'm going to end with two questions. Uh, and thank you so much for, for, for I know how, how busy you are. The first is a bit of a bit of a, a left field question, just because I like um, asking people who uh, I admire and find interesting different questions because I learn is uh, what, if anything, would make you end a friendship? Negativity. Negativity. I think you really, really have to be very careful about that. I think you know it intuitively. Uh, I've very rarely, I don't, I don't even know if I've ever ended a friendship, but negativity, I think is a real red flag. You've got to watch it because it, it drains yeah. you, drains you. Yeah. Uh, and the second question, which I ask all my guests and it's how, how we came to you because Nancy uh, answered the question by saying Francis Fitzgerald is who would you like to hear on five of my life next and why? I thought you might ask me that, Nigel. And I, I was thinking, actually, there's an Irish woman. I'm going to pick an Irish woman. And her name is Ellen O'Malley Dunlop. And there was a pirate queen way back the centuries in Ireland called Grace O'Malley. And she is a descendant of hers. And in a couple of months' time, there's going to be a very big meeting with a former governor uh, from the States called Martin O'Malley. And Martin, actually, he'd be great to have on as well. He is an amazing, but you'd never allow me two choices. But anyway, mm-hmm. Ellen O'Malley Dunlap, she's also done huge work uh, for Irish women over the years. But she has this fascination with this little island off the island uh, of Ireland called Clare Island, where Grace O'Malley was from. And Grace O'Malley sailed the seas to go up to London to meet Queen Elizabeth I. And she has a castle. On that island it was her castle. It's not restored. It's a, it's an old castle there. But I just think you'd find it very interesting and your listeners from a historical point of view. And also it will give you a feel of, you know, modern day Ireland, which, you know, I hope I've given some flavor of that as well as being nostalgic in our discussion this morning. Well, that is a wonderful uh, recommendation for someone to join the Sixer Club. Uh, Francis Fitzgerald, thank you so much for sharing your choices on Five of My Life. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's been most interesting and I'm kind of surprised at some of my own choices, but they kind of, it's interesting how they kind of hang together in an interesting way uh, and that you brought out from the questions, Nigel. So thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you follow Five of My Life, you might enjoy my latest book, Smart, Stupid and 60. In it, I write about a number of the issues discussed on the show. It's the 20-year follow-on from my first book, Fat, Forty and Fired. If you have any feedback on the book or suggestions for the show, please get in touch via my website, nigelmarsh.com.